All right, so we're gonna get started and we're gonna talk today a little bit about um, providing therapy for children, adolescents, uh, and how to apply this to the school system. Uh, the vast majority of it will be related to um, K to 12, but I did have a, a slide on uh, the counseling center. So we're going to talk about uh, children, adolescents, and the, and the school process. So this will be one of our uh, special populations talks, right? So uh, without further ado, let me share my screen if it'll let me. All right, so uh, our first learning objective is to describe the various types of groups and considerations that affect running groups or conducting groups in school settings. We'll discuss things like recruiting, screening, selecting participants. Uh, we'll talk about various guidelines and uh, best practices when running groups with children and adolescents. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about the various therapeutic factors linked to play therapy and how it's applied to children and adolescents. We'll talk about developmental themes in adolescents. Uh, most of it will be grounded in Ericksonian work and the concept of the identity crisis and how that affects teenagers. Uh, then we'll discuss the various challenges you might experience when running groups with adolescents, uh, guidelines um, for helping adolescents deal with anger and conflict, which is fairly common uh, in adolescents. Uh, we'll talk briefly about um, structure of groups in counseling centers and schools. So this lecture provides a, a general format uh, it could be applied in many different ways. Uh, the first two are very concrete and clear cut. So discussing how to apply groups to children and adolescents, that's pretty clear cut. Uh, the application to counseling centers and university centers, uh, that's fairly clear cut. It'll be covered. But these principles can be applied to private practices or community mental health centers, whether they be public or private. So uh, in general, when we run a group, we put an emphasis on prevention and intervention. When we talk about prevention, uh, what we're really talking about here is primary prevention. And if you've taken a psychopathology course, you've probably heard of primary, secondary, and tertiary prevention. Well, primary prevention is to address an issue before it occurs. It's an issue that you can anticipate and uh, you address it before it becomes a problem. Whereas secondary and tertiary prevention are more or less intervention strategies once the problem has emerged. So the intervention, uh, an intervention can happen in an early stage of, uh, of development. So uh, you can address drugs and alcohol in a group setting before kids are using drugs or when they first start using drugs or after they've developed a substance use disorder and it's interfered with their life. So tertiary prevention is after it's become a significant problem. Now, when we run groups, we wanna target before it occurs or along that pathway, uh, early stages or later stage, in a way to promote um, student development, healthy functioning, and help them navigate their uh, activities of daily living. What we find is that smaller groups are incredibly important when working in school settings. And I know I've talked to you about eight to 12 being the range of acceptability for groups, but when it comes to school, especially um, 
in early childhood, middle childhood, and adolescence, you might consider uh, six to eight, which is smaller than a, a, a traditional group, but that also gives each person more space to, uh, to participate. So we see research suggest that smaller groups are better. We also want to make sure that um, the groups are, are doing what they're supposed to, which is to help uh, uh, develop uh, as a full functioning person. Um, and, and that includes their physical uh, domain, their cognitive domain, and their socio-emotional domain. So uh, you want to make sure that it helps the full person. Now, I'll give you an example where we've seen a lot of research. When working with children on the autism spectrum, if a child is not in a mainstream setting or classroom, it's not uncommon for them to have a six to one ratio. That's six kids to one teacher, right? Or an eight to one ratio. And you might ask yourself, well, why, why not the 25 kids that are in a standard classroom? Well, it's the same principle. Smaller groups results in more individualized attention and that results in better outcomes. So uh, that's important. Now, group settings or, or group therapy in, in school settings, better yet, tend to be brief, uh, highly structured, whether it be through a psychoeducational or cognitive behavioral orientation, they tend to be very problem and solution focused. So you might remember earlier in the semester, I talked about uh, solution focused brief therapy, right? The group itself tends to be more uh, homogeneous. So the more similarity helps the therapeutic alliance, especially if you're gonna have a few sessions. So the, the shorter the duration of the group, the more important it is to have a homogeneous uh, membership. Uh, I already said that uh, the orientations tend to be CBT or psychoeducational. Now, when it comes to dealing with more severe mental illness or severe problems, that usually is not going to happen in a, uh, a group therapy uh, setting for schools. It's not the setting uh, for that. Uh, it's not uncommon if you have severe and persistent mental illness that you're trying to address. So things like schizophrenia or whatnot, you're not going to do that in a um, school setting. You're gonna refer them out to uh, either an outpatient clinic or an inpatient hospital, depending on how regressed they are at that point. So understanding uh, the level of care that you can provide is gonna be important, right? Because uh, school counselors, you're focusing on schoolwork, friendships, bullying, things like that. But severe mental illness, you're not gonna be able to, to do in a school setting. So you need to know uh, when it's time to refer out or when it's time to refer to a higher level of care. And when I say higher level of care, it's because that individual needs more attention uh, or the issue is more severe than you can provide an intervention for in the school setting. So uh, referrals, like I said, can be an outpatient clinic for weekly therapy. It could be an inpatient hospitalization in the cases of schizophrenia or suicidal uh, intent and plan. Um, it could be a social services agency uh, if there's some issue related to their home life. So you need to know when to do a referral and you need to make it part of your practice to have a list of referral resources for each of these domains. I have for, for my independent practice, uh, 
a community mental health agency in all five boroughs. I have a recommended psychiatrist for all five boroughs. I have inpatient hospitals that I recommend to in all five boroughs. I have social services uh, contact for all five boroughs that I have just in case I need to refer out. So when you're building your practice, however you're doing it, you need to have these resource sheets to make sure that if they need higher level of care, uh, you do that. All right. So developing the proposal, you wanna make sure that your goals and purposes are uh, expressed clearly. Now here's the deal. This proposal is oftentimes in a school setting going to be reviewed by the principal and or the assistant principal, as well as the guidance counselor. And I know I'm gonna say this later, but you want to make sure you have the blessing of the administration for whatever proposal you're going to do. Because if something goes down, if something goes wrong, and you didn't show them your proposal, then you're leaving yourself on the hook. So make sure that the proposal is written well, the, the goal and the purposes are clearly explained. Make sure that you get the blessing of the administration, make sure that the rationale, the need for the group is clear, make sure how the children are going to benefit or the adolescents are going to benefit from participating is clear. And as with all groups, you want to make sure your targeted interventions, procedures, and evaluations are clearly listed. Now, I've said this before, very little of this is new, except for the fact that you want to get the blessing of other people. And this is a good example why you would write a proposal, not just for my class, but in agency work and school school based settings, you're going to need another person's approval. So you also want to demonstrate that whatever stated gains they're going to get are accomplished. So you wanna make sure that you can assess your outcomes using an evaluation and your documentation is on point. So as with all other groups, you have collective goals and individualized goals. If we were to think about today's session that we did, uh, we have an overarching goal of the session was to address uh, various aspects of stress and allow you to pick where you wanted to go. And we picked school-based stress to focus on, but notice how even though collectively we're all focused on school-based stress, each of you were assigned unique homework. You're gonna come back next week and report what you did and the effect it had on your mood. And if we were writing a session note, we would chart that next week for your personal file. Now, just to give you an idea, my memory is imperfect. So I took notes, right? I took notes, very brief notes as to what you said and how it fit into the, the group. Um, so when you work towards your individual goals, we need to be able to document progress. You also need to develop an attendance policy. Similar to other groups, it's important. But here, because this is happening in a school setting, you might be pulling a person out of another class in order to run this group. It's not uncommon for this to happen. Uh, the period that's most common to pull someone out is their lunch period, or if they had a free period, that one, so that it doesn't interfere with their academic curriculum. But uh, what happens if someone has a test and they can't come. You wanna develop a student-friendly attendance policy. You also want to um, address when a person just doesn't show up, right? They're in school, there's nothing wrong, but they don't show up. How do you handle that? And then you also wanna provide an orientation for the parents. Because you're working with minors, 
you need to have both the consent of the parent and depending on the age, if you're working with uh, preteens and teenagers, you also need the approval of the child to participate in a group. Both parties have to sign. But you want to provide an orientation to the parents for several reasons. One is so that they know um, what uh, you want to accomplish, what their child is expected to get out of it. But you also want to reinforce, even before they sign the consent form, that just because they signed their child up doesn't mean they have access to what their child said. And that's going to be very important to tell parents because, hey, what Johnny and I speak about, you don't have access to. It's protected information. But I'm their parent. I understand. But in order for them to feel safe, they can't have to worry. They shouldn't have to worry about me sharing with you. Otherwise, maybe they won't be honest about, let's say, their issues that they have with you as a parent. Are they going to bring that forward if I have to report back to you? All right. So you want to know your state laws with regard to working with minors. Um, what I'm talking to you is New York state law. Uh, the laws differ from state to state in terms of who signs the consent form, who doesn't who has access to the information, you definitely uh, wanna make sure that. Now, you wanna emphasize um, confidentiality, but there are limits to confidentiality. So you don't wanna tell them that everything they say is gonna be confidential because that's not true. In theory, if the school bills the insurance, then the fact that you went to that session the fact that there is some diagnosis, the insurance company needs to know that. So you can't keep billing related matters confidential. You can't keep court orders confidential. If the judge orders you to appear and talk about something, you have to appear. Kids need to know this, teenagers need to know this. If there's any form of abuse, neglect or maltreatment, you're a mandated reporter. Kids need to know that if there if there's suspected abuse, neglect, or maltreatment, you have to report that to um, social services. So uh, that's important, right? And abuse comes in three forms: physical, emotional, sexual. Neglect comes in a form of school-based neglect. Let's say the parents not making sure the kid goes to school and the, the kid is just staying home and not going to school for a month on. Well, you have to report that. Um, if you're getting high with your parents, that's reportable. And you get the idea. So kids need to know uh, abuse, neglect, maltreatment. You're a mandated reporter, so you have to report that. If they're um, suicidal or homicidal, you have to breach confidentiality. As it relates to suicidal, I have to care about you even when you think nobody cares about you. I have to love you even when you feel you're unlovable, right? So if you're suicidal, I have to protect you. If you're homicidal, then you're bound by Tarasov and each state has their own guidelines with Tarasov law, the ethics, right? But if someone is suicidal or homicidal, you breach confidentiality. You have to report that both to authorities and if there is a specified target, the target, so that they can uh, protect themselves from harm. Now, so I've listed these things and you would tell the child these things and you wanna explain to them uh, what is confidential, what's not confidential, because I've listed everything. If it's not any of those things, it remains confidential. Now you need to get permission from the parent and the child. Uh, you need to communicate what your expectation is uh, of those in your group. You wanna emphasize confidentiality to the extent. So if you're dealing with a teenager, let's say that the teenager is engaging in 
risky drug use. Do I report that? Let's say they're buying cocaine. Well, that's illegal, right? But you do not work for law enforcement, right? As, as long as the parent isn't getting high with the child, then that's not reportable. That stays confidential the same way if you're working with an adult and they were part of, I don't know, the mafia or they're engaging in tax fraud. You wouldn't share that with anyone. You don't have a responsibility to snitch on them, so to speak. Only if there's an imminent harm to the person themselves or another person. So you want to make sure that they know that they could talk about activities that they're doing that might not be legal um, and there's a safety there and it doesn't go back to the parents even though they signed the consent form. Now we we want to think about practical considerations like the size of the group which we talked about shrinking it down a little bit. We want to talk about the setting uh, some of the uh, some of the limitations of things happening in school is that these are going to be their peers the same way you're each other's peers in the, at the university people are learning about one another so you want to think about how to manage that you want to remain neutral as much as possible do not judge use exercises and techniques uh, that will open people up and talk but remain open-minded and flexible, right? So that's very, very important. And you would be surprised, but people develop strong attachments to you. Even though the group might go for 15 or 16 sessions, uh, they're, going to, they're going to miss the group when the group is over. So you wanna prepare people for termination. So if it's a 12 week group, maybe you wanna start preparing week nine or 10. If it's a 15 week group, maybe you'll start week 12 or a 16 week group, maybe week 12, but you're spacing it out so people can adjust with the process of saying goodbye to one another. Now, play therapy. Play therapy as an incredible technique when working with children and adolescents. It's received tremendous popularity. I know when I talked about various theoretical models, I mentioned play therapy and Jacob Moreno and the concept of psychodrama. The nice thing about play therapy is it gives you an opportunity to discuss things in the natural language of the child in a non-threatening way. So uh, I remember with one uh, person I did like a family model where I had figurines of each member of the family and I asked him to like lay out the members of the family uh, in a way that best reflects their experience. And they had, you know, themselves, their, their mom and their siblings here on one side, and then their dad over here. And what we did was we processed, well, dad was facing the other way and very distant. And we were able to see, well, that's how this young man saw his father very distant from the family, disconnected from the family. And then you pay attention to, hey, I noticed that you're very close to mom and your sibling is on the outside. Tell me about that, right? So you can use figurines to understand family dynamics. You could use art therapy, right? So drawing. Uh, when you're doing trauma work with children, adolescents, drawing is a nice way to get people to express themselves in a um, indirect way where you can process that. You can use sand tray therapy or, or, or art therapy. All of these things are incredibly useful. Now, if you want a book that's changed the way I view therapy. Uh, there is a book called Dibs in Search of Self, D-I-B-S, In Search of Self. And I don't want, actually, you know what? I don't want to overtell the story because when you read it, you're going to go in one direction. And by the end of the book, it, 
it opens your mind in a different way. But long story short is this a kid who is largely nonverbal and the parents think that he has some intellectual deficiency or disability. Uh, so they take him to uh, therapy and he's nonverbal and whatnot. And the therapist works with him and cracks the code. So beyond that, I'll encourage you to get the book. I won't ruin it for you. All right. So we talked about different things of play therapy, whether it be drawing, uh, sand, uh, sand tray, figurines, puppet theater, uh, quilting for trauma is good. Now, your group play therapy in the school should focus on interpersonal issues, how to relate with one another in the school or issues that either are getting in the way of academic performance or things, skills to teach that help with academic performance. But play therapy can work with interpersonal stuff. And it also is valuable to create safety signals for the child. Now, shifting to adolescence. When we think of adolescence, that's from puberty until when you leave the home at early adulthood. So the time frame is anywhere between 11 or 12, roughly, all the way to about 25, right? So that's adolescence. And if we were to think about Eric Erickson, Eric Erickson says that during adolescence, this is a time period we're trying to figure out who you are. You're trying to figure out uh, your value system, what's important to you. Um, you're trying to figure out what you want to do, right? You're, you know, what you want to do at the next step. You're trying to figure out relationships, both friendship relationships and romantic relationships. You're trying to figure out who you're attracted to and, you know, how to express your love. You're trying to develop a clique or a friend group, right? All of these things are important. So you tend to have a lot of stress on you in adolescence and emerging adulthood. So you're just trying to figure everything out. Now, very, very common is that there's strong emotional reactions in adolescence. And very common, there's a lot of tension um, both at home and in school. So if we go to... Uh, G.S. Hall and Margaret Mead, which were two theorists, they had a debate whether uh, adolescence is a period of calmness or a period of conflict. And what we find is that both of these theorists took the extremes and it's somewhere in the middle. So Margaret Mead said that teenagers experience it's the most peaceful time of their life is adolescence. And we know that's not entirely true. And G.S. Hall said it's a period of, of storm and stress. And we know that he overstated the level of conflict. So we do have conflict, but not at the level of G.S. Hall's argument. All right. So we want to work on family-based conflict and friend-based conflict uh, as part of the process, very, very common. Now, one thing that's interesting in adolescence is there is a shift from a focus of the parents having the most authority to your peers having the most influence over you. So there is this shift that happens where seeking approval from your peers matters. Uh, you, you're going to seek their approval more than anything. All right. Now, if you have a group experience that's positive, you're going to discover who you are, what your core values are, um, what your beliefs are, how you navigate relationships, and how you make decisions. All of these things could happen. Now, we know that in addition to figuring out who you are, we also know that adolescence is a time period where there is this naivete and i don't mean this in a bad way but it's almost like you believe the world is either perfect or should be perfect 
And due to the idea of seeing imperfections in the world, you become advocates, right? You, a lot of social justice experiences emerge from teenagers. Uh, for example, March for Our Lives, right? So when we think about March for Our Lives, that is a national movement, but in New York, uh, they were tired of the gun violence. So uh, they did protests, they did rallies, and they met with legislators. And, um, you know, gun violence is a problem. I, I think if you turn the news on this week, you would see it, but it's also a problem in the schools. So whether you look at Columbine, or Newtown, uh, uh, Connecticut, or uh, Stoneman Douglas in, in Florida, we have decades after decades of kids shooting other kids, kids killing other kids. Um, and when I say kids, you don't actually have to be a child, but you could be in this adolescent stage. Um, so, it's a problem. And because of that, uh, March for Our Lives New York did a whole host of meetings and they got a law passed called the Emergency Risk Protection Order. And this is a law that is similar to any uh, order of protection that if a person is at a risk, uh, they have to create distance. There's a stay away plan. But for this, the Emergency Risk Protection Order is about staying away from guns. So a teacher, school counselor, principal can report a person as being a public safety threat. And you can get an order of protection where you remove their guns for a temporary period of time from the household. Now, some of you may not have guns in your household, but if you have guns in your household and, and a child is talking about uh, shooting up a school, well, then we have to protect the public. And that law got passed. Now, with all orders of protection, they're temporary. So you're not taking away a person's guns forever. You um, have a certain period of time before the judge where it's a temporary order. And then after the judge rules, there's a certain amount of time that the order is in effect and it has to be renewed. So in order to maintain the person not to have their guns. So I know that some people are like, oh, that's an infringement on the second amendment, but it's a temporary issue due to severe psychological distress that you wanna make sure that the person doesn't do something regrettable for themselves or other people. But that comes out of advocating, right? And that is one of the strengths of adolescence. So finding your voice is another characteristic. All right, so when you're leading uh, adolescent groups, you wanna make sure that you're clear in your guidelines. You wanna make sure uh, that you, the rules of conduct are clear. You wanna make sure that the people who are in your group respect you and accept you. Um, a whole host of techniques can work such as music, art, drama, humor, all of these things are important. You also wanna um, deal with the biggest issue, which is trust and limits uh, to self-disclosure. So with adolescents, you can oftentimes either overshare and put yourself in vulnerability of being bullied or you might undershare because you don't trust. So finding that sweet spot is gonna be important. Uh, and you wanna deal with any inauthenticity in the group. Now, cultural sensitivity is gonna be very important. You wanna demonstrate respect and understanding of people's value system. Um, you wanna make sure you understand uh, why a person says what they do. And trying to understand um, an adolescent does not mean you become one of them. So you don't have to behave in a way that's not dignified to gain their respect. Now, uh, adolescents are going to challenge you. They're going to challenge you 
more than most groups. In fact, other than a prison population, adolescents are probably going to push you the most. So uh, they're going to test you as a group leader, and, and they want to know that uh, you're not going to model all the people who hurt them in the world, right? So you're an authority figure, so they're going to challenge authority, but you need to embrace that in a non-judgmental and a non-defensive way, and that's going to help you uh, function better. All right. Now, learning the language that people speak is going to be important. And here's an example where, um, where kind of like I didn't get it. So, all right. So I remember I was working with a 12 year old um, male who had significant issues uh, in his home life in school. And um, I don't remember what he said, but he said to him, because of my reaction, he's like, ah, you're tight. And um, now generational gap, I said, thank you. And me saying thank you to him confused the hell out of him. Why am I saying thank you that he referred to me as tight? Well, in the 90s, when we wanted to give a compliment, we would say, oh, those shoes are tight, right? That would be a compliment. But it's used differently today as um, I got you angry or you're angry, you're bothered. Um, but I didn't know that. So <laughs> learning how, how to speak the language in a way that is received is important. So uh, anyway, uh, I must have been defensive at that point, but I also uh, it helped us bond learning that. Now, in a school setting, you're going to deal with issues of metal detectors. You're going to deal with peace officers and law enforcement to reduce the likelihood of aggression and violence. But here's the deal. You can have as many metal detectors as you want. You can have as many peace officers as you want. But that's not going to solve the problem. And in fact, you may hear this language referred to, speaking of other legislation we're working on in New York State, uh, is to address what's referred to as the school to prison pipeline. Some of you may know what this is. Some of you may not know what this is. But the school to prison pipeline uh, suggests that how we discipline minority youth actually puts minority youth at greater risk for incarceration. So when we suspend or expel teenagers from school, or we are overly punitive, we run the risk of them finding another outlet for uh, their time. They're more likely to become truant, more likely to engage in criminal activities. So we are working on a law in New York State uh, as part of New York State Psychological Association to change how schools deliver discipline. And it's called the Equitable Discipline Law that we're working on to change it to a more compassionate approach, to a more supportive approach, rather than a punitive approach, because there are way too many uh, minority youth and, and, um, and 20s, 20 to 30 individuals in jail cells. Uh, so whatever, we want to change it. So metal detectors and law enforcement presence does not solve the problem. So let's find a way to do that. So doing groups to help people deal with anger management and conflict resolution is going to be much better at addressing the problem. So anger management, conflict resolution, you can run. Either one of these can be a group. So everybody gets angry. I've been angry before. I'm sure everybody in this class has been angry. But it's what you do with the hurt you feel 
I know I sound like Mr. Rogers right now. It's what you do with the anger you feel that matters because anger does not have to turn into aggression. Conflict brings intimacy, but conflict does not have to uh, fuel violence. So in groups targeting anger and conflict, you wanna help people develop interpersonal skills to talk things out to engage in problem solving behavior, to engage in self-talk, because sometimes you might be dealing with another person who's equally dysregulated, but they, they are, have reckless abandonment. So you might have to talk to yourself to talk yourself down, not to do something that's regrettable. So teaching these skills could be useful. So shifting towards college, College Counseling Center. It's just another school-based uh, setting. Again, it's time limited, many times lasting only up to 16 weeks. And you might be like, well, why 16 weeks? Because most semesters are about 15 to 16 weeks. They tend to focus on educational development, uh, tend to deal with uh, school mastery and passing one's classes. And I know you know we have a counseling center. Um, we ran these groups for people. We also could have career planning groups. What's ironic is that I'm talking to you about this and sure enough, these were some themes we discussed in our group, such as stress about what comes next. I think Brenda said that, right? So um, career planning and the anxiety that comes with with uh, school and stress management and grief groups. All of these are important. Now, it's interesting, by the time you're in college, you probably are, have dealt with a loss. If it's a grandparent, that's the most common. If it's a parent, that's also somewhat common. So you can run grief groups to help deal with grief and loss. COVID has created a whole host of grief, group, grief groups in at, on university levels, cultural identity groups. So, you know, St. Francis College and the CUNY system, they're really, really good because there's tremendous diversity. So helping us appreciate individual differences and celebrate those differences are important. Non-traditional age groups, so St. Francis College also, you know, we have first generation college students and there's no um, expiration date on education. So we have a larger number of non-traditional age students. So how, what if you're an older student and, you have, and you're around a bunch of people 18 to 22, you might feel out of place. So having a group to help non-traditional college students cope could be useful. And as always, self-esteem groups, right? That's, that's tremendous in middle school, high school, and college. These are very common. All right. Now, what are the key points? So um, if you're going to design a group in a school, make sure you get administrator support. I think I've said this before. Do not go rogue because you're leaving yourself at risk. If your administrator doesn't support your group, don't run it, it no matter how well-intentioned it is. You wanna communicate with students and children uh, about the importance of keeping confidence. Now, if you're in the same class with someone and people share very vulnerable aspects of their life, you don't want people going around talking about that. You wanna keep the privacy. So what happens in group stays in group and you wanna say it in a way that they understand, right? And you might even talk, especially because there's a, a level of egocentrism at this age, you wanna talk about, you wouldn't want someone talking about you, right? So we wanna keep everything private or confidential. Now, don't just throw every kid who has a learning problem, self-esteem issues, being bullying into a group. 
not every child is ready for group participation. And even if they are ready for the group, they may not share as much. Involve parents in the group work with the children. That isn't to say you share with the parents what they say in the group, but if there are exercises that are meant to be done between groups, you might link the parents in to ensure that they get done. And then role playing is quite useful, especially when it comes to peer pressure and whatnot. And that, my friends, is today's lesson. Any questions on that? Okay. Um, one thing I didn't say in the lesson is also you want to make sure that kids don't feel like you're talking down to them. And I'm using the word kids which in of itself might be a bias. But if you're working with children, adolescents, you don't want to be like, oh, what do you know? You're just, you're just a teenager or things like that. You wanna make sure that you don't engage in ageism. I know that um, when you think of ageism, you might think middle adulthood or late adulthood, but there is a form of ageism called adultism where you believe that if you're not an adult, you know nothing. You're meant to be seen and not heard. But children, adolescents, they have ideas, they have um, wisdom. And it's your job to celebrate their wisdom and not negate their experience. So with that, I'm gonna stop. Does anyone have any questions before we, uh, we conclude today's session?